Mr. Derek Vienhoff. He's better known as Deke. Drinking liquor with DJ Deke, we out laughing. Yeah, Deke. Hello, everybody. Welcome to DCast, episode 75. I'm here with Richard Saunders from Australia, all the way from Australia. How's it going, Richard? All, all the way from Australia. I'm doing very well today. It's, uh, it's pouring with rain. It's the middle of winter, but it's nice to be inside. That's great. I think you're our first, I want to say you're our first Australian guest. So there you go. Okay. Uh, now, Richard is a skeptic, and he's the host of The Skeptic Zone. Um, how many episodes have you done of that now? There's over 400, is there not? Oh, wow, I wish. Actually, there's uh, 612. The next episode will be 612. Okay, so there's a lot. Of, there's a lot. <laughs> so I'd have to go, yeah, I would have. I tried to go back and watch them, but there's a lot of them, so I couldn't get through all of them. But um, I've got a whole bunch of questions for you today. So you're also a professional origamist. Is that how you pronounce that word? Yeah. So we'll have to get to that at some point before we finish the podcast and see how those things are at all related, if, if any. But so how can you give us a little bit of your background and, and how you came to, to be a skeptic? Yeah, well, when I was a kid growing up in the 1970s, watching shows like uh, Leonard Nimoy in search of watching movies like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, hearing reports about monsters, it was it was a golden era of what they used to call ESP and then the unexplained and Bigfoot and all that sort of stuff. And as a kid in my uh, teens or whatever it was, it was, it was just so uh, amazing for me in you know, all these things. And naturally that's, I thought a lot of them must be real because that's the information I was getting from media and from books and from TV and sensationalism. So I got intensely interested in those, especially UFOs and things like that expecting them to be real alien spaceships visiting the earth because that's when you say a ufo that's the thing that comes to most people's mind in the back of their mind they're thinking an alien spaceship coming to earth so i was always from as far back as i can remember even watching yuri geller on tv in australia when he used to come to australia in the early 70s bending spoons the general feeling was this man can bend spoons He's going to come on TV now, and he would come on TV and get a spoon and bend it. So convinced was I as a little kid that these things were real, because that's what we were being told, that when Geller came to Australia and was on TV, my brother and I hid the spoons in the house because we were feared they would bend. Anyway. Through, through the TV or... Through the TV, because that's the sort of thing that was being put about. You know, Geller would say, you know, and people at home, they report their spoons are even bending. So when you're a little kid, you believe everything that you hear. What You don't have the faculties yet to uh, distinguish things. So with all that, uh, I guess it's really piqued my curiosity which is one of the, you know, the basic driving forces of our uh, species is our intense curiosity. But over the years, of course, and it eventually dawned upon me that year after year after year after year would pass, I was getting older and older, and these things were still considered to be a mystery and they still haven't been shown to be true. And there was something in the back of my mind saying, well, that can't be right. You know, if, if these things are real, if people really can bend spoons, if the monsters are really there, if aliens are really visiting the earth, then after years and years and years, which turned into decades, why, why isn't this accepted and known and studied and part of our society? Right. And then, but, but one of the major turning points was the 1980s, the early 1980s with the series Cosmos with Carl Sagan was shown in Australia. And that just spun me around. That was incredible. Then, around the same time, James Randi, the famous magician, who later became a good friend of mine, came to Australia and did some water divining, water dowsing tests, which were broadcast on TV. And uh, that was very eye-opening for me. So, many things. But I think, you know, at the root of it all is just this intense curiosity about the strange and the unusual. 
Uh, you mentioned a bit of how it's a component, the curiosity is this component to, to us. How far back can you trace, say, the history of skepticism? Would you just call it the scientific revolution? Like, is that where the history would take you? Depends. I mean, if, if you're talking about sort of philosophical skepticism, you can go right back to the ancient Greeks, which is a, an interesting area, to be sure. But what I mean when I'm talking about skepticism is modern scientific skepticism, which really dates from the late mid to late 60s uh, through the 70s where it blossomed into the 80s and so on. And this is the, the, the really the joining of forces originally between scientists and magicians, oddly enough. Again, getting back to people like Yuri Geller, who were doing what we know, uh, because I'm also an amateur uh, conjurer, as conjuring tricks, sleight of hand for entertainment. Uh, and, and again, Randy was a major force here as a magician, a professional magician and a damn good one. He was uh, quite pissed that these uh, people were, were passing themselves off as having divine supernatural powers when they were just doing tricks out of the magic books. So my skepticism, when I say I'm a skeptic or I'm in skepticism, that's what I mean. It really dates from... Uh, the mid to late 60s through the 70s. Okay. And one of your favorite things to debunk or, or talk about is, is it ghosts and the paranormal? Is that, um, I think you've mentioned that that's one of your yeah. specialties. <laughs> well, uh, yes. I'm, I'm what they call, somebody called people like me once a Bigfoot skeptic. And what I mean by that is my heart still lies with the paranormal aspects the mysteries, the ghosts, the hauntings, the, the UFO, the old stuff, the UFOs, yeah. stuff you don't hear so much about these days, apart from really the people who claim they can talk with the dead. That's an evergreen. That keeps going and going and going. UFOs have really had their day. I mean, you don't hear much about them, not compared to decades past when they were very prominent and they would feature quite often in the media and mysteries and TV. Now they're quite, it, it's nostalgic because again, as I say, decade after decade after decade, our technology now as a species, what we've invented collectively is starting to get to the point where it's rival, rivaling the, um, the early UFOs anyway. I mean, right. I, I, I really love the movie from, was it nearly 20 years ago, Independence Day, where the UFOs are zapping around, but there's the fighter jet, and the fighter jet's almost as good as the UFOs. <laughs> right, right, right. So, but I do like the old stuff, you know, looking for monsters and looking at haunted house. I guess it's nostalgic. There are still lots of people out there who, who firmly believe in all of this stuff, so it's worth knowing uh, how these things work or what people think about them. Um, in particular on UFOs, I just watched uh, Dr. Stephen Greer's more recent Netflix special, Unacknowledged, from 2017. I think his previous one to that was Disclosure Project or something like that. But do you have any thoughts on Stephen Greer? I know I, this documentary is is very agitating because um, he really sounds like a bullshitter, and sometimes he's like crying. <laughs> he's crying while he's explaining these stories, and you can just tell he's like putting on this act and. Um, Maybe if you could talk about that and, and maybe how it relates to, uh, you know, you have these authority figures like pilots and generals and fa past presidents that all, you know, say they've seen or yeah. that there's this well, evidence. You've got me, you've got me at a disadvantage because I haven't seen that. Okay. So I, I, I can't, you know, obviously comment too much about something. I, I'd have to watch it. Part of the problem is there are so many documentaries, books, items, articles, reports on especially UFOs, but many fields, that no one person can cover them all. So when I say I, I haven't seen that, there's a gap in my knowledge there, which is very hard to fill because I, I can't get all this. But your question about authoritative figures, generals, pilots commenting on these things, well, they're all humans just like you and me, and they all have frailties and our eyes can deceive us and our brains don't work the way we think they do. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's sort of what we call the appeal to authority. Ultimately, it doesn't matter who says something. It really doesn't uh, if they can be mistaken. And it needs to have lots of supporting evidence and be thoroughly researched. And you can't fall into the trap of, of 
accepting something someone says because you want it to be true. Right. And we all do that. I'm sure I do that. I probably hear something from other skeptics or scientists I admire or I, I think that they uh, have the, the right idea. And I say, oh, of course, you know, that must be true. And every, every now and then we're all shown to be wrong in that respect. But I guess get back to the evidence. I mean, you can have a thousand documentaries with a thousand generals and, and pilots saying they're here, they're here, they're here after 20 years and they're still not here. You've got to say, well, what happened? Did they all go away again? Where's the... Where's the uh, yeah, the, the most the unfortunate part is that Dr. Stephen Greer at the beginning, you know, they say, well, everyone's always asking, where's the evidence? And I say, the evidence is overwhelming. But he doesn't explain the evidence. He just says these two statements that, you know, we have this pile yeah. of evidence. We have 3,000 sighting uh, or uh, landings. We have so ever many thousand, uh, you know, but they never really get into specifics. And that's the kind of yeah. weird part about well, it. Well, to, to a lot of these people, stories, anecdotes, testimonials, to them, a solid evidence, and and that's that's really how they they view it. Oh, I've got twenty reports here from people in the Midwest, and they also, and they consider that to be rock solid evidence. And to the scientific community, of course, well, it's not. It's stories and things written on paper, and uh, it, it, it's interesting. It might lead somewhere, but you certainly can't get that, even if it's a, a pile of papers ten miles high, and say, "Here's the evidence." Well, no, it, they're all just stories and testimonials. Right. Um, how would you explain then for just as a devil's advocate thing, when, when people mention, uh, you yeah, I think it was, I don't remember if it was Ford who said this, I think even Reagan said he saw a UFO, Bill Clinton, Jimmy was Carter. Trying, Jim, oh, it was Carter and Clinton was trying to push to actually sort of disclose this stuff or whatever. And it's like, what is there to disclose? Like what is the most likely explanation for say UFO sightings? Are, are we just seeing things or is there military operate? Like what is, or is there a mixed bag of these explanations? It's hundreds. It could be hundreds of things. Right. I, you know, I, and you can't, you can't, you can't tell in every case because you weren't there. And even if the cases were true, which sometimes they just made up, sometimes they're real, sometimes people are mistaken. There are too many. You can't just say, "How do you explain a UFO?" You'd have to know the specific case. And right. in the case of Jimmy Carter, from my memory, tells me that he was looking at Jupiter or Venus, one of the planets, which they later discovered where he was looking in that time of the sky in the night it was probably a, a planet but people mistaking the planet venus for a flying object is not unusual people mistaking particularly bright stars like canopus i think can happen i was with i was with a group of people once in the evening and we we're having a nice barbecue or something looking out in the sky and there was this bright object coming towards us and my friends were trying to decide what aircraft it was and after two or three minutes, it was still there, which doesn't make any sense. So I got out my iPhone and I did the star chart thing. And, oh, it's a star. You know? Right, right. So, of course, there are many things. That's not to say, as Carl Sagan once famously said, I can't prove that alien civilizations aren't visiting the Earth every second Thursday. I can't. They might be. They might be right behind me now in invisible form studying this conversation. I can't disprove aliens, but what we say as skeptics is the burden of proof is on the people who say they definitely are here or I saw an alien spaceship or it landed here. Well, that's good. You need to, you, know, you need to really be forthcoming. Of course. And unfortunately, again, uh, in this documentary, I'm mentioning they, they disparage Carl Sagan <laughs> by saying that that one time he was very, he spoke very highly of the possibility of, or the fact of UFOs or aliens uh, being here. And then at some point he was pressured, uh, of course, you know, by some government force or agency into changing his uh, views, which obviously, I mean, anyone who knows Carl Sagan, he doesn't really uh, take anyone's advice on how to form his wow. views. Wow. I probably have to say I, I doubt that. But <laughs> another, an another thing, and I, this is what I tell High school kids, uh, we've all grown up with fiction like Star Trek and Star Wars of them pressing a button and going into warp or hyperspace or something. And for the story, for narrative, for a, a thrilling tale, you need to go planet hopping or visit another star system or whatever. That's, that's fantastic in fiction and stories. But unless there is some st startling and, and incredible 
breakthrough, we cannot beat the speed of light. And even if we were to travel at the speed of light, it would take at least four years to visit the nearest star and a hundred thousand years to get to other places in our own galaxy at the speed of light. Another thing that, that I like to, to tell high school kids is that our planet's been around for what is it? Uh, four or five billion. Someone's going to correct me on this. Something like Some that. Billion, five or six billion. Yeah. Six billion years. Okay. Intelligent species capable of space travel has been around for the last blip of those billions of years, scarcely a blink, hardly anything. The odds of a similar uh, species in a similar state of scientific development, maybe only a couple of hundred years advanced, being anywhere near us in the galaxy, it, you know, you can't even calculate those sort of odds. So it's entirely possible that a very advanced species capable and we wouldn't have a clue how of getting from planet to planet came and went 3 billion years ago and they're gone. Or in 2 billion years, someone 10 light years away might arise and develop space travel. So it's the, the scale which we can't comprehend really and the time scale we can't comprehend really. So the odds of a similar species to us or something that can travel visiting us You'd have to take all that into consideration. Again, it's not to say it's not happening, mm -hmm. but it's when you when you take those into consideration, it's just very remote. Right, and is this the Drake's equation? Is that the um, the concept about how vast yeah. the universe actually is? That there there probably is perhaps some other life uh, based on the size, but the likelihood that it's anywhere near us that we can measure or reach is very, very slim. Yeah. It, the Drake equations, I, it's really interesting. I think it changes every year because they tweak it. You know, they discover, discover more exoplanets or they see that this uh, number of stars out there of this caliber are, are X, Y, or Z. Uh, yeah, but it, the Drake equation basically is the idea of trying to figure out how many intelligent species could, could be or should be in the, in the galaxy. But it's... Um, it's more of a mental exercise than anything else because there are so many variables that we don't know the answer to, but it's a good way to think about it. Right. Um, the, um, the, the idea of a coming disclosure that constantly gets uh, bandied about more in smaller circles is kind of similar to these uh, apocalyptic uh, years, right? That there's always there's this apocalypse coming uh, or there's this disclosure coming or, or UFOs are going to reveal themselves and this constant dates constantly change. And the, it, there's a similarity there. Um, can you talk about that mm. at all? It is a big similarity there between that and religious cults. Uh, one of the things religious cults do is they'll string along their devotees for years saying, basically, any day now, it's coming, get prepared. And we've seen this have terrible consequences with things like uh, Jim Jones and other religious cults, the uh, Heaven's Gate cult, etc., yeah. mm -hmm. um, who... Unfortunately, you know, a lot of people died because of this, but it's, it's, it's how you keep people going for years in your organization. You're saying it's going to come, it's coming, and they'll even give them a date. You know, 2012 was a big date, if you remember that, all the fuss about the 2012 and the Mayan calendar. Mm -hmm. Every year there'll be a cult or some date marked as this is it, Jesus Christ will return or the aliens are coming on this day or this is the day prophesied. Uh, and it keeps people stuck going you know in various belief systems and whatever when the day comes and nothing happens then they will oh okay yeah we got it slightly wrong we actually took this star into consideration the real event is happening in three years i hope you get ready oh yes we'll get ready and that that's a never-ending loop that goes on and on so that spans all sorts of uh, belief systems right it's kind of a moving of the goalposts but yeah i guess you, i guess you could put it that way sure but but while the date is always just ahead, then people will. As, yeah, as long as it's not yeah. too far. If it's not like you know, it's got to be in your lifetime. It can't be like three hundred years yeah. ahead. Yeah, really care. That's a good. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. The day it's in five years' time or three years' time. <laughs> yeah, I think in twenty eleven there was even billboards around Sydney, and I can't remember the family radio 
Harold Camp. Was this a small church or something? Or yeah, yeah. See, there are so many of these. Yeah, things. there's so many, but that does sound familiar too, vaguely. Yeah, he he um was a in the U.S. I think his name was Harold Camping, or Campling. Someone can look that up. And their cult, for lack of a better word, put it out that the world was going to end in August or September 2011. And I even met somebody downtown Sydney handing out these flyers. Um, so there'll be another one. There's probably yeah. one today. I don't know. We better hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, you know, some another point that I have here that uh, we were mentioning uh, appeal to authority, um, switching to sort of nine eleven truth. Uh, you know, when I looked at American engineers for nine eleven truth uh, over the years, I realized that they, you know, they have thirty two hundred members who are, I guess, architects and engineers in the U.S. And I looked up how many architects and engineers are in the U.S. There's one hundred nine thousand architects, and there's one point six million engineers in the U.S. So that's 1.7 million, roughly, uh, both of these professions, which means it's about 0.2% of, of these professions are a member of this uh, group. And so that means 99.8% of architects and engineers believe the official story of 9-11. You know, it, like, it's like these... Uh, they try to twist the statistics or, or not show you the statistics in the proper way to make you think that this, you know, these people have this authority they know better, but it's yeah. weird that there's only that many members. Like it seems like a detriment to their cause. Yeah. But it, it, it I mean, if you've bothered to look, a lot of people wouldn't, they would just <laughs> hear that these hundreds or whatever it is of, of uh, engineers. Uh, and there's another saying, I can't remember who said it now. It doesn't matter how crazy the idea is. You always find professionals or PhDs or doctors who will support it, you know, right, a, a right. percentage of them. And a big fuss is made out of those. And I must say that 9-11 conspiracies have sort of had their day, I think. You don't hear too much about that anymore, not like you did 10, 10 12 years, years ago. ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like the moon landing hoax, the people who say that NASA faked the moon landing. Yeah, 15 years ago, that was a really common thing you'd hear a lot about. Not around my dinner table. That's still... Uh, <laughs> still <laughs> Right yeah um and and one day that'll just be skeptical nostalgia i hope you know, in, just, in i hope in a few years when we go back with this artemis mission is supposedly you know people yeah. will then hopefully change their mind or understand some more will yeah some will uh, you get the diehards who have to die and yeah. uh, I, that sounds horrible but a lot of people who have these beliefs won't change until the day they die and that's that's yeah, it's, one argument that you hear sometimes that I have heard recently is that, you know, why haven't we been back? And I mean, that's not really an argument because there's could be a million reasons why we haven't been back. Yeah. Um, but when I asked this person, once we go back, if we go back, would you believe it then? And he said, yeah, for sure. So I guess in five or six years or whenever that is, he'll uh, he'll come around. I, th you know, I think a lot of people won't even think about it because when the original uh, space shots were on in the original Apollo missions, and I was I was I saw it. I was very young at the time. I don't really have a, a good memory of watching uh, Neil Armstrong on the moon or Buzz Aldrin, but I was what I was watching the TV when it happened. But the people of the time, just why would you think it was fake? I mean, there were so many reasons to counter the moon landing hoax. I mean, one of the best ones is that the Russians were tracking every step of that mission. If it was fake, they would have. Yes, I, I always Hold bring that one up. World. I always say, that, what about the other countries that they were competing with? Yeah. Of course they would have, yeah. Of course. of course they would have. Ah, but they're all part of the conspiracy, you see. Ah. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, this in the new mission will be different because it's not going to be just government agencies. They're gonna, it's going to be more of a commercial uh, cooperative thing with, with SpaceX and these different um, yeah. companies that are going to have these it's modules. It's going to be thrilling. It's, it's going to be, be, yeah, it's going to be great. Mind-blowing. I, I, mean, I, sh I shed a tear at the Na when the NASA video yeah. dropped. I, I did. Sh I shed a tear at the end of that video. Let's let us let us uh, you know, skeptics. Let's f cross our fingers. Every all the skeptics out there, cross your fingers and hope <laughs> it goes well. Yeah, because exactly. I will be glued to the screen to watch sure. that. It's sure. just heart stopping stuff. It's it's thrilling. It is amazing. Um, 
I guess switching gears a little bit, I, I saw some, I checked out some of your videos and I did see one where you're discussing the, those power bracelets, the hologram bracelets. I, have those gone out of fashion completely as well these days? Not completely. You can still probably get them online and around. People still try. This is the, I happen to have one. Here we go. Of course you do. It's one of the, it's one of the original ones. It's called the uh, power, power balance. balance. Yeah. There, oh, there it is. So I'm actually, I've Look seen them before and I did, I do have a family member that wore one or wears one or used to wear one. Um, but I never looked into much of the mechanism. So it's some sort of hologram foil, yeah, it's like just, it's a piece of foil. No, it's a, it's a real hologram, you know, like on a credit card, you get a little visa logo or whatever. Sure. They're cheap. They're cheap. It's just mass produced. They just the machine pumps them out. When I look at it here, it's, you know, it's got holographic imagery, but, and, and it's just a rubber band. It's just a, yeah, probably cheap. Sturdy. Probably made in China somewhere. Ten cents sold in Australia for sixty dollars. Ten cents. Holy to make. cow, that's a markup. Yeah, sure is. So the what how that worked, and uh, I don't know if you might be able to link to a video I did about the the tricks. They would sure, yeah. do uh, what we call balanced body tricks, and you can learn how to do these, and you can fool people. Uh, that so that looks convincing if you've never seen it before it looks like there's really something happening it's sort of like a magic trick combined with science sounding terms like embedded frequencies nanotechnology uh, using something called the Schumann resonance which is a it's a real thing it's to do with the way that wa waves and, and uh, things bounce around our atmosphere it all sounds very sciencey they put all these together do the trick and say it's because of this resonance and this embedded frequencies and that's all it took and people endorsed it they really thought it worked it was the placebo effect partly you know you, you think this thing on your wrist is going to help you you feel more confident you perform blah, blah, blah. better because you have that thought or yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but uh, it was featured on a tv show here and a news type tv show uh, and it was reported on very uncritically. And they said, it's amazing. Look at this. And I watched this show and I'm doing this. You know, oh. <laughs> uh, I contacted the producer of the segment and I said, look, I just saw this segment. I know you're getting a lot of feedback from it. I know how it works. I, I can show you how it works. Oh, so they flew me from Sydney to Adelaide. They also flew the Australian distributor from Melbourne to Adelaide. Adelaide was where the show was being made. And they let me uh, test him or they let me, I advised them how to do a proper test, a blind test or a double right. blind test. Right. And this poor guy, he failed in the studio. He failed six out of six tests. I think they only broadcast four tests. I can't remember. It was, it was about uh -huh. 10 years ago mm. or he failed five. And at the end of the fifth failure, I took the reporter aside and I said, listen, I think we better stop now. He, what are you going to do? He keeps every, every test. He it's failed. You know, I'm starting to feel sorry for him because I think he was a true believer. I really think oh, right, right. he thought this thing had powers and he was the distributor and he was making money and he was very happy. And it's, Oh, it, it, it was killing me. But you know, that's just, that, that's just one of the downsides of being a, a skeptic and debunking things from sometimes I don't mind debunking and, showing up the, the cons and the sharks, but when somebody's sincere and they really think they've got a great thing and, they're, and they've got a song in their heart, yeah, it, it, it's not good. Anyway, so that story went out and within some few months later, the, it really led to the downfall of the company like a snowball effect because then people saw this story. It failed. The government here in Australia, Australia made the reaction on their website uh, stating that this thing doesn't work and eventually people are, launched class actions against power balance in the US so it was quite something right now those came about in was it the 90s or 80s those bracelets no I first saw them at the end of 2009 oh, okay oh, mid 2009 okay. I think they really something like that that makes yeah, sense. But, but, I remember seeing them around 2000. Like they must have, yeah. I, think, I think it was early in the 2000s, but yeah. Huh. 
but but the tricks they use where you you stick out your arm and they press down on your arm and you lose your balance they've been around for a very long time i remember seeing similar tricks as far back as the early 80s or the late 70s on tv where they were saying that colors can change your strength and your balance so they'd show somebody a big blues card or something and then they'll be strong then they'd show them a pink card and suddenly their body would be weak but it's using the same tricks like you're a bull or something or it's some sort of animalistic like you know that yeah what, show a bull what, of color what, whatever they were peddling at the time yeah. you know. <laughs> whatever um, pseudoscience they were peddling you know the more i talk about these different topics with other skeptics like brian dunning and and different people like that I, the more i find that a lot of these categories of things uh, the explanations are very, very similar and the mechanisms by which they trick people are very similar. Like I have these others listed here that I wanted to touch on like Qigong and, and uh, hypnosis and different things. Uh, it seems like a lot of the, the tricks uh, that they pull to convince you are very similar. Um, hypnosis though, is that where, something where there's a little bit of reality to it because of people's susceptibility and stuff like that? Yeah. You know, that's, that's one of the things that's always been a great, curiosity to me i don't know enough about it to give you a a good answer although what i suspect from what i've seen over the years is i suspect a lot of the reports and claims are are overblown right as far as i know there is some therapeutic use for it but when it comes to things like uh, using it to recover lost memories. That's been debunked a long or time past ago. life in regression, fact, those types past, of things. Yeah. yeah. In fact, it leads more to invent, people inventing false memories and things like that. And there's a myth that it was used to anesthetize someone for an operation for appendix, I think, in China. Whereas the truth, as far as I can recall off the top of my head, is well, they, well, they had anesthetic anyway. Um, you you can't do that, hypnotize somebody, and then do open surgery on them. You know, right. They're going to scream and run off the table. It it just doesn't happen. But the story is out there, right? And that's what people have heard, and that's what people, unless they really think about it, it's probably what they accept to be true. Oh yeah, you know, you can hypnotize people to anesthetize their arm, and they can have surgery or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and there was a hip a guy come out. In Australia, about four years ago, there was a, a, a short run show about stage hypnosis. And the guy doing publicity for it, the hypnotist, was on the radio saying that, oh, yes, people can undergo surgery. And I wanted to get on the radio and say, well, do you, are you volunteering to show us how it works? You know? Now, you mentioned um, you were an amateur magician or illusionist, or what, what would be the term that you... Uh, uh, conjurer, yeah. I... Conjurer. Part, part of having a sort of a well-rounded um, s- a skeptical knowledge is knowing how, you know, magic, sleight of hand works. Sure, um, yeah. And I, I, I used to know a lot of tricks, and I used to do tricks for my nephews and nieces for parties and stuff like that. It's important to have a bit of an understanding of sleight of hand and misdirection and mentalism because every now and then that's what we come up against when people are trying to do stuff and pass it off as paranormal and whatever it is. Uh, I don't do as much as I used to, but I've got, I, there's a great show called fool us with Penn and Teller. You're probably familiar with yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. I listen to Penn's podcast a lot. It's uh, yeah. And it's a wonderful lesson because it shows that even two of the greatest magicians in the world, they can also be fooled. Right. So, and I've certainly met a lot of people who have seen things like spoon bending and insist to the point of anger that it has to be real because they saw it. So we kind of glossed know. over spoon bending. Did, what is the explanation or are there multiple explanations again? Are they magic spo- Are they special spoons? Are they? Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> well, you have one there, I guess. <laughs> Look at that. This is just a spoon from the, from the, the shop, the, uh, the catering store. Um, mm-hmm. There we go. Stir my coffee with it. Uh, it's nothing special. I buy them by, I've got a packet over there because I do demonstrations and stuff. I have to buy lots of them. I walk into the catering store and I say, another pack of the spoons, please. They say, oh, it's you again. <laughs> <Here we go. laughs> but it's really, 
it's really an optical illusion. I don't know how well this will work on on uh, video, but if you get a pen, this is just a a regular sharpie. Yep. And if I hold it right, I don't know. Do you see that? Classic, classic. The rubber pen. Looks, yeah, I do it all the, the time pen. in the office. Yeah. Okay. So you know that's your eyes playing tricks on you, right? Right. The same thing happens with a spoon. If you hold it right, let me see, like that, and you start to work it, and when you're doing it. You're trying to implant in people's heads that it, the spoon will bend, and their brains will, will go into overdrive. You say, "Look at that! Look how it's getting wiggly!" And people look at that, right? And it looks like it's getting wiggly, right? And that's just practice and misdirection, and saying and, and, and convincing people that spoon's getting rubbery and everything. And people go, "Oh, that's amazing! Yeah, I think I can really see it, see it, you know, wiggle." Sure. And you can actually convince people that that's getting. See that? Yep. Looks like it's getting, oh. Definitely. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Hmm. Uh-oh. Oh, wait a minute. Did you actually just bend that spoon with your mind? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So what, like, I mean, what about when they, <laughs> they literally twist them? Don't they sometimes twist and contort into, like, helix formations? Yes. Yeah, that's another one. I've got uh, books and DVDs about uh, all all that sort of okay, stuff. Okay, so the explanations are out there. We just need to take the time to to look into them. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the it's the old magicians thing. Is um, you know, you, you don't blurb secrets away. You don't you don't just willy nilly give secrets away. You know, you, right. you're happy to teach some people or whatever the case may be. Yeah. But um, if if people you know seriously interested, they they can study it. Uh, and ideally, if they're really interested, they become uh, become magicians and entertain and thrill a lot of people. Right. Uh, a friend of ours is um, works in a magic show, and then actually, she's one of the dancers that then turns into tigers and whatnot. And she'll she's never revealed the secrets at all. We see yeah. the show multiple times, and we still don't know. And it's really quick the way they do this stuff. It's um, Greg Furwin is the magician. I think he goes around the world, but he you know the the way they switch into tigers and change yeah. costumes even and stuff is very, very fast. And so obviously they know what they're doing, but, um, well, in a way you don't want to know because of course, of course. you leave the, the show and your, your eyes are dazzled and your brain's going, what the hell, what the hell? And when you learn how it's done, it's like, Oh, okay. And a little bit of the real sort of magic sort of disappears, but from sure. someone like me, you know, I have to have a bit of an understanding about this stuff in case somebody comes along and says, look, I can do this amazing thing using psychic power, then I can say, oh, wait, hang on a second. I know now, when we talk about magic or, or conjuring, are we talking about real magic, like Aleister Crowley magic, or is that is that a whole other category of nonsense? Um, well, I mean, when I say magic, I mean the magician's art, the conjuring arts, the sleight of hand, the thing you practice for years and years and years and practice and practice because they can be really hard. Um, and that goes up to stage magic. It's well thought out. It's rehearsed. It's you rehearse the patter, you rehearse the misdirection. So when I use the term magic, that's what I mean. Although I think more specifically that should be called conjuring. Sure. Like Aleister Crowley would yeah. be more of the spirit world and, um, uh, energies and, and strange, um, well, that's Pants. just another parent. It sounds to me that's sort of bordering on paranormal claims. It, it depends on what what he puts himself out there as. Again, I'm not too familiar with what he does. I mean, if he's if he's doing it for entertainment and fun, uh, he, I think then, he's long dead now. But he it was an occult thing. Um, honestly, I'm not that well versed on it, but. Okay. Um, uh, I know it's this whole other category of things that is not really about uh, magic as we know it, but they call it real magic, which is um, uh, maybe I'll have to find another guest that uh, can speak on that uh, another time. That, that, yeah, that's 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 confusing. I mean, it just sounds like somebody making claims, you know, ultimately. Yep. Um, you mentioned James Randi, and you you got to befriend him. Is he still kicking? Or yes, he is. He's yeah. nineteen ninety three. Wow, he's out there. Randy, nice. forgive me. Yeah, I think he'll be ninety three this this year. Very Something cool. like that. He's he's retired about five years back. Uh, I haven't seen him for about five years myself, but I had the pleasure of working with him for oh five or six years in Las Vegas every year. And he came to Australia in two thousand fifteen and he and I did a tour together with some other people around the country. So that was um, that was great fun. 
And you mentioned he retired five years ago. That looks like about when they stopped the uh, prize for that $1 million prize that nobody ended up claiming because thousands yeah. of participants came forward and could not replicate a paranormal uh, event. So yeah. uh, is that is that the the timing there that the, that ended with his retirement? Yeah, it's, or? It, it's more or less. I think that the prize really wound up around the, la- the time of the last amazing meeting in Las Vegas, which is about five years ago, partly because Randy was retiring and – uh, and I saw partly because, yes, after decades, nobody had ever even passed the initial test for the prize. Right. And there's administration. You know, if you put out a million-dollar prize and say it's open to everybody, to sift through the applications is a job. Yeah. You have to employ somebody, and it's administration. And it's very hard to construct tests. It's surprisingly hard to to do that every year in Las Vegas, we would get somebody at the amazing meeting, which was the big James Randy meeting every year. And we would test them live on stage at the end of the convention. And it took a team of us, the whole convention simply to get everything right for that one test. It's a lot of work. So I'm not surprised it wound up. We still have a prize in Australia. The Australian skeptics have $100,000 in Australia. If somebody here can do anything of a paranormal or supernatural feat. Uh, and again, that prize has been going for almost 40 years and no one has ever passed the initial stages of that. Would somebody say, well, the reason we're not participating is because then, well, no, I was going to say they would say our secrets are, would be revealed, but that would be more of a magic thing. They're supposed to supposedly yeah, not yeah. secrets. They're supposedly real paranormal um, abilities. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we have people coming up with endless excuses. I think <laughs> by now, oh, it's incredible. By now, people don't do it because, A, they know they can't, and they're just their job is to con the, con the population. Or another reason I've heard is they, they also know that nobody has ever passed. Therefore, we, the skeptics, must be cheating. Right, and they right. wouldn't. They wouldn't. They're not going to waste their time with us because we obviously cheat every test, and right. and that's very easy for them to say because a lot of people think negatively of skeptics. Yeah, they're skeptics. They're closed-minded and they're liars and they're cheats. Of course, they wouldn't part with the money. It's all a con, you know. Blah blah blah. We've heard it all. Of course, of course. Is it is it sort of unfortunate that um, uh, conspiracy-minded pe- people as well as skeptics, uh, both of their goals is to get to the truth quote unquote but it seems that they have sort of different approaches one is based on pure evidence and reason and logic um and the seemingly the conspiracy side seems to be um uh influenced by some other force uh whatever you want to call that the conspiracy more or less the people who are seeking the truth are seeking the truth that bears out their conspiracy, whereas the scientific skeptic is seeing where the evidence leads. Right. So it is a, it's a huge difference. And there's gray areas because, you know, we're all human and it's very hard to divorce yourself from what you privately think. But ultimately, conspiracy theorists, anti-vaxxers, 9-11 truthers, they have their truth. That's it. This happened. Now I'm going to find evidence to back up my my uh, uh, idea or my my belief whereas hopefully the scientist or the skeptic says well what is the truth what what, what is happening let's look at the evidence and evaluate it and see what see what goes that's why partly why we have these prizes right it's to challenge people who are making these amazing claims but also if somebody came along and did an amazing claim you know, under satisfactory conditions, then that's something we would dearly like to know about, which harks back to my younger self, this curiosity, oh, can this really happen? What's this power, you know? And to discover something like that, it would make our $100,000 prize look like peanuts. Of course. When you think of the money that you could generate from somebody who had true psychic or paranormal, or somebody, if they could bend metal with their, using some power we don't know about yet, Right. It's, it's mine. Yeah. Speaking of making money from these abilities, um, one other 
point that you hear sometimes is that there's a cure for cancer, right? Or a cure for whatever disease. I mean, first of all, me being a layman, but knowing a little bit about science, I believe that even if there was a cure for quote cancer, there's multiple types of cancer. I don't think that there would be one cure that administrates and then solves all these various cancers. Um, But other than that, the argument they always uh, point to is, you know, there's so much money to be made by keeping a cure uh, secret. But isn't the opposite true? Isn't there so much money to be made by discovering a cure and administering it? Wow. Could, could you imagine the sales of a drug that truly could cure even a certain type of cancer and do it well? Right. I mean, the company could write... Could, or the fame, the Nobel standard. Prize, the fame that a scientist or a group of scientists would achieve uh, through this achievement, right? That this would be yeah, worldwide yeah. Uh, stardom, yeah. basically. And I mean, that, that's what, and I know a lot of dedicated scientists around the world. A very good friend of mine is a, a researcher in, in America, Dr. Rachel Dunlop, a, a very good skeptic. And, and she's dedicating her life to this. You know, she does. If she finds something, she's going to just suddenly su- suppress it or yeah. hide it. <clears throat> right. I mean, and, and there are thousands of people like her all around the world in every country working tirelessly to, to make, uh, you know, to, to do these stuff, to invent or d- to discover, I should say. So, but it's just so easy, isn't it? Just to say, oh, it's a conspiracy. They're just hiding the truth. That's it. Goodbye. Right. I mean, I mean, especially to think that there would only be this one scientist that discovers it on their own. Like, how can you, there's usually a, there has to be a team or an organization yeah. or a university behind this research. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah. it's not just one person in their lab in the basement, like a cartoon. Yeah. Um, but, but, but the crazier thing is, of course, in a sense, this is happening every year. Every year, medical science is discovering things which are just astounding, you know. Uh, we're all living much longer in better health because of this, but we just take it for granted. We don't realize. You know, mm-hmm. There are many things we don't have at the moment because science has done it. Science has found the cure and made our lives a lot better, but we just take it for granted. It's Yeah, conspiracy theories come around all the time. I mean, they're, they're in everything from UFOs to the moon landing to right. you know, hiding the truth about everything. Now, some of the ones that we mentioned today are we're, we're mentioning that you know they're they're less prominent than they used to be, or people don't believe them as much anymore. But uh, during this pandemic, um, it seems to, well between the pandemic and of course the North American or American politics and world politics based on American politics, there seems to be so much um, confusion and belief of strange things and fake news and all this thing. So where does the skeptic mind come into play in all of these things? And and where do you see, what are your thoughts on uh, the pandemic and then the different um, beliefs that people have about, about COVID specifically? Yeah. I guess our our job is to fight the conspiracies and the misinformation as best we can, which is <clears throat> which is very difficult because there's just so so much out there. Um, if, if if there was an official position, I I don't know if there is an official position of the skeptical movement around the world with the pandemic. It would be aligned to the scientific uh, outlook, which is there is a pandemic, it's killing thousands of people, and there is things we can do to help contain it and flatten the curve that's would be the, the look but you know what we can do about it as a group or me individually is simply try to get the information out to as many people as possible that the conspiracies that you're hearing about are baseless or bizarre or uh, are harmful and, and then i mean of course the other problem that arises is the uh, who um is seen to be this i don't know trying to play from their side of the field now some sort of uh, i don't know if you want to call it uh one world government thing conspiracy whatever it is they whatever they think it is regardless of conspiracy thought even in the academic world um there's people that agree that the communication perhaps from the who has not been ideal um and I, one of my friends is an epidemiologist he just started a youtube channel to try and explain epidemiology a little more to the public um during times like this for example when um con- communicating studies and results of studies, uh, you know, based on our current social media, uh, quick online article reading type of uh, 
you know, news cycle these days, a lot of people are very confused, uh, uh, specifically from, from the information that the WHO puts out. And I, I sort of don't blame a, a large swath of them because it is a little confusing. And it's unfortunate that that leads people to think, you know, well, well I'm not even going to believe anything they say because, uh, yeah. you know, although if you want to be right, you need to change your mind. And of course, they are just reporting things that, uh, you know, as the studies come out, uh, you know, we don't know everything right away, of course. And so we have to work as a society to understand uh, COVID, for example. And, and so there, you have to uh, understand that there's going to be changing information. But a lot of people don't understand that. Yeah. And, and again, it's just very simple to write them off as soon as they make an error. Of course, they're going to make errors. I mean, this is something which hasn't happened in 100 years, which is taking dramatic turns all around the world, which is unpredictable. Uh, if someone like the WHA could come out with the right advice from day one, it's not going to happen. Right. It's, not, it's run by people. They're doing right. the best they can under extremely difficult circumstances. So as soon as they make an error or get something wrong or say or backtrack, which just happens to all of us, it's just part of existence, uh, then the conspiracy theorists can jump on it and say, look, how can we trust them when they did this, this, and this? You know, And to a lot of people, especially when they're scared, they're just looking for very simple answers. And if the simple answer is, look, they were wrong, don't trust them. Yeah. Uh, I, can, I can understand the appeal of that. The other thing that doesn't make sense is if they say one thing and then they come out with the next day with an opposite statement and you say, well, I don't believe them. Well, which one don't you believe? Yeah. Right. Yeah. There has to be some level of truth in yeah. something of what they're, yeah. And, and again, it's like the guy with the power balance. I can have sympathy for a lot of people being confused or misled or whatever it is it's it's difficult you know and i try not to just think negatively of, of all the people who fall for all this sort of stuff they're just humans like you and i try in, in a lot of cases trying to do the best they can in very difficult circumstances that's a great point and i was going to ask you about that how it does affect does it affect you emotionally because sometimes i find myself getting a little irate or angry with people <laughs> and i try i try to be calm and realize that yeah. we're all human we all we all are trying to yeah, figure it yeah. out so yeah it's so easy to be angry you see a lot of people online just being angry and yeah. i don't know they've had issues in their lives and it's a great outlet for them to be angry and they can be angry and they're given permission to be angry uh, I get, I get angry. We all get angry. But when you're talking about the emotional issues, yeah, that guy who was doing the power balance, um, yeah, that was tough. You know, after, after the filming was done and I had lunch by myself in some cafe or whatever it is, I could hardly eat the food because I thought this guy's Poor not guy. going to have a fun time. Poor guy. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Too bad. Well, um, we covered a lot of, um, debunking and skepticism stuff. Now I wanted to ask you about the origami is the origami, <laughs> does the origami precede the skepticism? Yes. yes. The origami dates from the early seventies. Uh, hang on a second. When I was, uh, just a, a little kid, there was an origami show on TV. And I'd, I'd tried to fold along and it was shown once because that was TV in the 70s. There was no VCRs and stuff like that or whatever they use now. And um, so my parents took pity on me and they bought me this wonderful book from the guy on the TV show. And that was it. That was the end for me. I was hooked. And year after year after year, I kept folding, kept enjoying it. And eventually it led to me writing my first book on origami when I was hmm, 22 or something like that. And subsequently I wrote 30. I can't remember. I was going to say, yeah, I did, I did read that, all your publications. That's a lot of, a lot of books. Yeah. And, and it's something I still do. I still love to do it. Um, I make jewelry and lots of little origami things. And just... Earlier this year, and I wish, I wish I could say I invented this. I didn't invent this. Online, I discovered one of the best little origamis I've ever seen, which is this little, right, little kangaroo. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm, I've learned how to do that. So whenever I travel around the world, I'm going to make kangaroos for people because I sort of think, you know, Australians should make a kangaroo. So it's something I, um, I, I really love. It's a great creative outlet for me. And it also gives me a chance to step out of the world of skepticism completely 
and use another part of my brain and another interest entirely, which I think is, is a healthy thing. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, when you do origami, is, do, you, do you start with different sizes of paper or is the idea... Oh, you're yeah. Always, yeah, so it doesn't matter. There's different... Um, Oh, it doesn't method. matter. P- people right. use b- big paper, little paper, square paper, sure. triangles, rectangles. Ultimately, if you if you enjoy it and you fold something and, and you get great pleasure out of it, then have at it. You know, go, go have at it. Yeah. Cool. Um, so another question that I've been asking my guests lately is, what other podcasts, if any, do you listen to? If you have time to listen to others. Yeah, I listen. I try to listen to. The, the the cluster of skeptical podcasts like mine simply because it, it keeps me informed as to what else is happening in the skeptical world. So you had a guest on a short while ago, Brian Dunning from the Skeptoid podcast. Never miss an episode of Skeptoid. I learn a lot from that show. I listen to the um, the European Skeptics podcast, uh, the Skeptics with a K from the UK, Squaring the Strange from the, the U S and the skeptics guide to the universe and a smattering of other podcasts. And there's a terrific podcast I listen to called planet Maynard. So that's, that's a lot of fun. So yeah, I really, I love podcasts. I, 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 I like producing one. I like being on one. I like interviewing people, but I certainly appreciate the effort other people put into making podcasts too. Yeah. Very cool. They're definitely coming more into the mainstream. I know they've been around for a while, but uh, every year they seem to be getting bigger and bigger, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And every year I get I, I, I spend money on microphones <laughs> every year. Trying to upgrade as got, you go, yeah. Yeah, I've got my eye on a Rode NT1A at the moment. I might actually try to raid the bank of ba- balance and buy that microphone. I, I love microphones. I think they're great. <laughs> Very cool. Well, uh, Richard, I just want to thank you again for joining us today. And um, where can people find the podcast and uh, more about you if they want to follow you in that? Yeah, it, well, a simple thing to go uh, to do would be to go to skepticzone.tv. Uh, the Twitter is at skepticzone. If you go there, that's a great start. You can see the, uh, the list of episodes, um, who's on every episode. Uh, my show is in, in uh, chunks. It's like a magazine show. So it's an introduction, then a report, another report, another report. So people can simply look at the time codes and listen to whatever they want to listen to on my show. Very cool. All right. Thanks again, Richard. Take care. Thank you.